Today I'm going to talk about collecting data. Um, and I spent all of the first lecture talking about random number generators without talking about what we were actually using them for. Um, so here's a little slide of things to keep in mind when you're, I mean, we're all cryptographers, so we know that step number one of using cryptography is generate some random numbers. But just in case you were lacking on applications, here's some applications. Um, this is just what I thought of off the top of my head, so it's totally not comprehensive, but things that your computer is possibly encrypting, things like your hard disk, um, communications protocols, all of your encrypted web surfing and SSH and encrypted messaging, um, financial networks, um, hopefully are encrypted, although maybe not very well, um, things like Bitcoin, um, things like access control, sometimes use crypto, sometimes don't. Um, but there's also a number of non-cryptographic uses of, um, or semi-cryptographic and, and more systems-y uses of randomness in security. Um, things like address-based layout randomization, which is a protection against buffer overflows. Um, you just randomize thing in, things in memory so people don't know where to send their little buffer overflow to. Um, TCP sequence numbers that uh, protect against people injecting traffic into your um, TCP stream. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about TCP. Um, things like DNS source port randomization that protect against um, people spoofing DNS responses. So things, things you want out of randomness. So if we, the, the question that I'm treating in this collection of lectures <coughs> is, what happens when random number generation goes bad and how do we look for that and how do we as cryptographers understand and study this and one thing the the question that i'm going to treat in this particular lecture is if we want to look at this from a black box perspective we need to collect some data um, so you can either painstakingly go through the code of all of the random number generators and see is it sound or is it not sound um, or you can take the other approach and just get a whole bunch of crypto data and then look for problems. And some of these things are much easier to get data on than others. So that's what we will be doing. In particular, everything that looks like a communications protocol is, in some cases, the public key infrastructure lets us collect data. Okay. So research idea, let's scan the internet for public keys. It'll be fun. Um, so, here's more systems. I apologize, this is not cryptography. I guess some of you are mathematicians. I couldn't see the number of hands. Wait, how many of you are mathematicians? How many of you have never seen a slide that looks like this before in your life? Okay, everybody knows everything about networking. That's good. So, the, um, <laughs> Kenny was talking a lot about this. Yesterday we have um, the OSI model. I've, I've omitted one of the uh, layers here. Um, but we have this many-layered networking stack, um, and we have the, the physical layer of how things are actually transmitted, the IP layer that tells us what address we're to send things to, the TCP layer that actually um, ensures consistent um, transmissions, um, well-ordered, um, and also uh, your TCP transmissions are associated with a port that identifies the protocol or the application that will be listening on the other side. And then on top of that, we have, we have the actual um, uh, application that's sending data and, and the, the protocols that are, um, that are running on that. So if we want to scan the internet, um, we need to understand a little bit about how to do that. So if you are initiate, initiating a TCP connection, um, Step number one is to do the TCP handshake. So the client wants to connect to the server, it sends a SYN packet. Um, the server responds with a SYN ACK packet and the client responds with an ACK packet. So it's just the, the three step handshake for TCP. Uh, so this suggests a particular methodology if we want to find out people who have <coughs> a particular port open and are listening for connections. Um, you can just send a single SYN packet to them, and if they respond with a SYN act, then you say, okay, they're listening for connections. And you can do this very fast because this is low overhead. And um, this is the basic methodology that SYN scanning is based off of. 
There are a number of tools that do this. The most famous one is probably Nmap, um, the network um, mapper tool. Um, it's an open source port scanner. Um, it's optimized for scanning, well, it's, it's particularly op optimized for scanning all ports on a single host. So um, yesterday I decided to Nmap the um, attack school website and see what ports were open. So it tells me that um, we've got uh, a DNS server, an HTTP server, an HTTPS server, and, and a couple other things, which is interesting. Uh, but this is this is pretty standard, and this was slower than usual, probably because the network isn't very good here. Uh, so don't do this too much in the network because you'll make it worse for everybody else. Uh, but I'm going to be doing some amount of this uh, in the future. So, Nmap. How many of you have Nmap things before? How many of you haven't mapped things before? Okay, so maybe it's it's interesting. Um, so people at a certain point decided that well maybe we can end map the entire internet, and what does this look like? Um, and the first such study, at least that I've heard of, was in 2008. Um, this took three months and 2,200 CPU hours. Um, they searched many different ports and looked at who had them open. The first study that is relevant to us, I think, is the EFF SSL Observatory. So this data set was published in 2010. Um, they basically nmapped the entire internet um, and said, hello, do you have um, your TLS port, open, or you, do you have port 443 for HTTPS open? Do you speak TLS? If so, please give us your certificate. And then they, um, had a collection of every HTTPS certificate that was um, on the internet at that time, and they published it widely available on the internet, um, and gave several talks studying the <coughs> certificate authority infrastructure. I will talk more about TLS. You already heard about it from, from Kenny. I'll talk a little bit more about the particular cases that we care about here. Um, a couple years after that, um, this is the first one of my papers that I'll be talking about. Um, we actually started studying the EFS, EFS SSL observatory, but it was a year old at that point, so we rescanned um, the internet um, in 2011, 2012, and then continuing on, um, and uh, got a more comprehensive data set of uh, HTTPS certificates. And we were able to do a slightly faster scanner by optimizing NMAP and um, also parallelizing it using Amazon EC2. Um, this last study, I feel a little bit weird talking about it in an academic situation because this study, um, an anonymous enterprising individual um, and not the internet, found a bunch of routers that were accepting um, login to root over telnet using the, pass the login and password root and root. Um, he found several hundred thousand of them, uh, installed software to end map the rest of the internet and made a gigantic botnet that um, they used to just um, continuously scan the internet for several months and then published a gigantic data set of all of the results of this. So at the time, this was the largest botnet. Um, I should say that this is totally illegal and probably unethical, um, so don't do this. Uh, I don't know whether it's ethical to actually use the data in sort of published research or not, but it's out there on the internet. It's very interesting. Um, so it's probably the biggest data set of scan, scan data that we have. But one of the problems with all of these uh, studies is that Nmap as a tool is not well optimized if you want to scan the entire IPv4 space. So that's four billion IP addresses. Um, Nmap is very well optimized if you're scanning a single address or a collection <coughs> of addresses for every port, but it's not well optimized to do this like broad, um, very narrow scan of one or two ports for everything. So 
in the context of all of these studies, um, several people, including um, my co-authors on the Mining and Peace and Peace paper, wrote a much faster tool for doing these kinds of studies. Um, so uh, there's this called ZMAP. Um, and the Z is maybe for Zakir Durmarich, who is the, the first author here, or it's maybe because he turned an N sideways and it's a Z. Um, so this is a scanner that's optimized for large scans. Um, in contrast to taking days to scan all of IPv4, um, it can, at, uh, with a good uplink, it can uh, scan the entire internet in 45 minutes. Um, or if you have a 10 gigabyte uplink, then you can, or a 10 gigabit uplink, you can scan the internet in four and a half minutes, which is kind of amazing. Um, the increased speed is from avoiding the kernel TCP stack, so it talks directly to the um, Ethernet card. Um, and um, it has a bunch of optimizations, for example, scanning the addresses in random order so that you don't um, shut down single networks by overloading them with traffic from your very fast, powerful uplink. So I recommend not running this from this hotel and possibly not running it from your university without getting, like talking to your network people. Um, because, and definitely don't run it over Wi-Fi because you'll probably, um, you might shut down your network, you might get kicked off of it, you might make people very angry. So, um, but this is a useful tool, just make sure that you talk to people before using it. Um, now, um, I also want to talk a little bit about the legal and ethical issues, and this is in general not just for um, scanning, but also for some of the attack work. Since we are talking about attacks, it is relevant to think about um, the ethics of what we're doing and how we publish things, especially when you're looking at real life systems. And for the kind of research that I'm talking about, we can't actually do it without talking to real systems. So. Um, how do we do that in a way that will not get us into trouble and is ethical and makes the world a better place rather than a worse place? Um, so I'm more familiar with the system of US laws than EU laws. Um, but I, I looked briefly um, to try to figure out what the situation for um, EU laws for um, computer hacking. And I found this EU directive. I don't know if this is accurate, whether this like represents um, the situation in for the laws of any of your countries. I think that it's, it sounds like it's kind of a hodgepodge of, of weird laws. Um, but if it's not dissimilar to the US system, there's kind of two separate issues that you have to think about. One of them is um, in what is the analog of what it, in the US is um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which criminalizes unauthorized access to um, protected computers. Um, so that's the first two bullet points here, which the EU recommends that countries criminalize. Um, so illegal access to information systems. So access without right to, to the whole or any part of an information system. And I don't know what without right means, and it might be a little bit tricky. Um, we've had some court cases in the US about what exactly does exceeding authorized access mean. Um, so you don't want to break the law whatever the law means in your country. Um, another situation that comes up, um, and I don't know if we have an analog of this in the US, is illegal system interference. Um, this was another bullet point that sounded kind of relevant. Um, seriously hindering or interrupting, uh, interrupting the functioning of an information system by inputting computer data, by transmitting, damaging, or by rendering such data inaccessible. I don't know if this means, it, it looks like this is intended to criminalize denial of service attacks, maybe, and also things like um, uh, shell injection and, and you know, um, SQL injection, things like that. Um, but if you start trying to test for cryptographic vulnerabilities by, say, scanning the internet and um, giving it weird crypto data or asking it for, for un, unconventional cipher settings, I don't know if, and, and you happen to break something, I don't know if that would be covered by this. So, an, another thing to think about. Um, the last one is the, it looks like it's criminalizing wiretapping. So, um, illegal interception, intercepting by technical means, non-public transmissions of computer data to, from, or within 
an information system, including electromagnetic emissions from an information system carrying such computer data. So you guys criminalize wiretapping and um, uh, and looking at um, Tempest data, which is interesting. So um, in the U.S., wiretapping only covers content. And there is an exception for network providers to look at the metadata of the network flowing over the um, of the data flowing over their networks in order to diagnose problems. So in that in that sense, if you happen to own a network or you're running a computer, it's actually okay to do some research to understand vulnerabilities within your network. I don't know what um, what within this framework um, would allow that kind of thing. So another thing to think about, maybe go talk to your university lawyers. Um, but these are, the, these are the general principles that come up in, that look like they relevant to the things that I understand that come up in attack research and security research in general. So things to think about. Um, I'm talking about the legal issues. Um, in, you may be wondering why is scanning legal at all, or why is it ethical? So scanning is a very common tool used by um, many academic and security industry researchers. It is not something that should be criminalized. Um, and in particular, if you are just scanning and you are initiating normal connections with public IP addresses, that's not actually circumventing any access control. So it shouldn't, and I hope it doesn't um, fall into any of these kind of frameworks um, in any country. Um, it, I hope, does not fall into the relevant frameworks in the U.S. Um, so that's that's it for for ethical issues. If you're or for legal issues, if you're wondering like why this is legal, um, there's also some ethical principles like should we be scanning? Um, and if you want to do things like scanning ethically, um, you want to make sure that you are not causing problems for anybody in doing this. So. If somebody has a server up on the internet that is configured to accept connections, they should be able to accept connections without you causing them any problems, like a normal number of connections. Um, but as a scanner, you want to, say, scan at a slower rate um, and randomize your scan so that you're not overwhelming the end hosts. Um, you want to publicly signal that you are a benign scanner. Um, and that you were doing this for research purposes, and if they don't want to be included in your scan, they can contact you at this address um, and let the let end hosts opt out um, because you do get complaints. So, any questions on legal ethical issues? I think the principle here is that as cryptographers, security researchers, whatever, we want to make the world a better place, and we want to be the good guys. So you want to make sure that the things that you are doing are good and positive for the world. Even though attacking things is fun. Yeah? How many complaints did you get when scanning, when you did your scan in 2007? Um, dozens. It's like order 100. Yeah, order, order 100. Um, so as I said, my co-authors um, published a tool, and they actually scanned every day for years. Um, and they, they are continuing to scan. So um, they have gotten hundreds of complaints at this point, and they've gotten an order of 100 opt-out requests. If you, if you scan the internet, you can, um, if you scan HTTPS, you can, get, you can expect to get a handful of complaints. If you scan for something like SSH, you can expect to get a lot more complaints. So it does depend on what port you're scanning. Yeah. Do you take any care on uh, treating this data as sensitive in some way? So when you publish your results, do you have to tell people that uh, they will not sing about particular FAP addresses or just uh, shape them to see what I mean? So yes, there's, um, well, I guess there's two questions. One of them is um, for publishing scanning data. Um, so actually the, I hope I put a link here. Um, the scan data from here and several other projects has been published online at scans.io. You can just download the database of all the certificates. It's just all the raw data. Um, for the specific attacks, um, well, let's, let's see. We have not published raw data for SSH. Um, and in the computing private keys that I will be talking about in another hour, um, we did not publish the, the private keys. Um, it is completely 
I mean, it's simple for any of you people in the room to read our paper or after I finish this talk to just go and implement exactly what we did and repeat it. Um, so, but we're not just, we didn't put the data out there, we make people do a little bit of work to, to repeat it. Um, we also did not ever go public with the entire list of, of known vulnerable products. Um, we had a few examples in our paper um, and we linked to the security advisories that um, we knew about, but um, we didn't, we've never actually published the full thing, in part because it's hard to get verification in a lot of cases. I, I will talk a little bit about disclosure at the end and what the disclosure process looks like also. Any other questions about scanning, ethics? Are you all feeling ethical and legal? Ready to go out and attack in a positive and um, productive way? Okay, so um, the fun thing about scanning is that it turns into interesting results. So this is a map that I got off of the internet census, the botnet survey. Um, and this is a map of all of the live um, devices or computers on the network, which is pretty interesting. I mean, it looks like a population map, except that Africa is pretty dark. So they have, they have many other um, beautiful maps, including one that shows the diurnal patterns, so the, the day and night patterns of when devices are on and off. And you can clearly see um, uh, time zones and also uh, northern versus southern hemisphere. Here's a, this is a slide that I took from a talk by H.D. Moore, um, who is the author of Metasploit and has also been doing um, a lot of scanning work. So he scanned um, the whole internet on many different ports. Um, and this is a plot of the number of unique IPs for different ports. And you can see that the most common one is this port, um, which is um, the uh, UPnP, the plug and play for <coughs> devices setup. So all of these things are devices that can be remotely configured over the internet and they are connected to the live public internet. Um, there have been several um, really serious vulnerabilities in this. The next most common port is port 80, that's HTTP, so unencrypted web traffic. Um, we have port 443, which is HTTPS, so um, TLS encrypted web traffic. Um, let's see, Telnet, um, SSH, um, mail servers. There's a lot of fun things out there. Uh, but the first thing that you realize when you start scanning for things is that um, the internet <coughs> does not look like what you think it does when you use it as a user and a normal computer connecting to normal websites. Um, so this is a uh, pie chart of the um, top web servers that you see. Um, so if you, look at, if you look at it just from looking at people's um, web traffic, then you see everybody's running things like Apache and Nginx. If you look at it from the perspective of scanning all of the IP addresses and seeing what, what is out there running on the internet, the most common um, web server is Rompager, which is a, uh, an embedded web server. So I got some slightly different numbers from the Internet Census data, um, which has Rompager as number two. Um, but basically you can see from this that the Internet of Things is already here. So people are talking about, oh, the Internet of Things, we're going to have every device connected to the Internet, they're all be communicating with each other. We already have that. The Internet is filled with devices, not normal computers, little, little baby things um, that don't have a lot of power. So um, the top uh, web servers here, so we have the Allegro ROM pager, so this is an embedded web server. Um, we have micro HTTPD, so a, a very tiny, uh, lightweight web server, we have a cable modem, um, and it, it continues on down from here. So this is, this is the, the change in perspective that you get when you, when you scan things by IP rather than looking at um, all hosts based off of, say, the Alexa top one million websites. <coughs> okay, 
So I'm going to go over the TLS key exchange again because I'm going to talk about how we actually get data from, um, from TLS again. So fortunately, you saw this all yesterday in Kenny's talk, so you're all super experts on TLS. Um, but I will show you the slide again just to, to remind you. So the, the TLS key exchange, so here we have Aldous is connecting to this website. And I'm going to go over the RSA key exchange first. Um, so in this handshake, um, so Alice wants to connect to this website, so she sends a um, hello message and her client random, which is 28 bytes of what should be random data and a four byte time value. Um, and she also sends her list of supported cipher suites to um, the web server. And the web server responds with the server random, which also should be 28 bytes of random and then four bytes of time, and then a certificate, which <coughs> I'll show you a certificate in a moment, um, but it contains the web server's public RSA key. Um, and it, it should be any kind of key, but in practice it is RSA. Um, and the certificate also has a signature, hopefully from a certificate authority that says this is a valid certificate. This website has paid me money to get this valid certificate. Um, and the web server also chooses a cipher suite, um, which will say um, they're going to use RSA to do the key exchange and AES or whatever, or RC4 or many of the other um, fun, or Camellia, uh, fun symmetric ciphers out there, plus um, SHA-1 or something. Then um, Alice um, generates her pre-master secret, encrypts it to the server's RSA key, and um, sends it over to the server, at which point both of the servers have um, the client and server random and the pre-master secret, which they then run through their PRF function that Kenny was talking about yesterday um, to generate um, a list of uh, encryption and MAC keys. Okay, then um, just to make sure that they are all on the same page, they both MAC the dialogue to each other and then they start the actual um, encrypted transmission of, of the data that they were going to send to each other. So, everybody's an expert on TLS now? Everybody's happy? Good. Um, so, um, I put in red all of the things here that should be random in this transmission. So we should have a random, a client random, a server random, the RSA key should be random, the pre-master secret should be random, and actually the RSA encryption is randomized also. Um, and then the encryption itself uh, should also uh, be randomized if we're using random IPs, as we should. So we have a number of different things that should be random here. Uh, some of them are generated by the client and some of them are generated by the server. So um, the security guarantees that are given by the public keys, so these are the public keys in um, the, the RSA public keys in the certificate, um, they um, bind the domain names to the certificate. Um, so a certificate authority's public key um, is used to sign the certificate that says that this public key belongs to this website certificate. Um, and then the particular public keys that are within the certificate themselves are used to encrypt the session key information. So if you break um, the RSA public key that is um, transmitted in the certificate, then you could decrypt this pre-master secret and then uh, generate the um, encryption keys just like the two parties in the communication did and decrypt everything that follows. So that means that a compromised key um, could be used to, um, well you could man in the middle of connection because you can um, just decrypt, if you were a man in the middle then, then you were the malicious party sitting right here intercepting everything here um, and you can say if you know the public RSA key, you can just, um, well, if you, uh, you can just decrypt starting here and then intercept all the traffic and decrypt it here. If you have a um, certificate authority key, then you can um, man in the middle of the connection up here, replace um, the certificate with any certificate that you want with your own public key, and then um, retransmit all the traffic back and forth that way. Um, 
the, Kenny was talking about forward secrecy yesterday. Um, so just to reiterate, um, with the RSA key exchange, um, if there were, for example, some large intelligence agency that were connect collecting all of the encrypted traffic going over the internet, I mean, not that we have any reason to think that such a thing exists, but if such a thing did exist, um, and people were using RSA key exchange for some reason, um, then if this intelligence ag agency had all of the encrypted um, handshakes and the communications, and then after the fact they were able to somehow compute um, the private keys for some of these RSA keys, then they could decrypt this piece and then decrypt all of the traffic. So this does not provide any forward secrecy guarantees whatsoever. One single website, you get their private key, you can decrypt anything that was ever sent to them. And if you have a certificate authority, um, if you have the private key to a certificate that has that is able to sign other certificates, then you can sign for any website you would like. Uh, there's no protection against that. Um, so this is a picture of what a um, HTTPS certificate actually looks like. Um, so this is Bank of America, which I guess is a poor choice for here, but it's a bank. Um, so the certificate contains several fields. There is, um, well, you can see that there's this chain of certificates going <coughs> to the VeriSign um, Class 3 Public Primary certificate, Certification Authority, um, which is built into the browser, and the browser says, I trust this certificate. It signed um, some uh, other certificate, the VeriSign Class 3 Extended Validation SSLCA, and that and sign the certificate for bankofamerica.com, which is what Bank of America sends to me when I connect to it. Um, and Bank of America might send this entire chain just in case I don't have it. And then I will check whether I have any of the, cer the certificates in this chain um, built into my browser as a trusted certificate. So that's kind of how the chain of trust works for TLS. Now, the certificate contains the common name, which is the URL of the website that I'm visiting. Um, it contains information about who um, signed the certificate. Um, it contains information about um, the signature algorithm that I'm using. It contains some dates that the certificate is not valid before this date or after this date. Um, and then it contains the public key. So this is a 2048 RSA key. Um, it has X10 um, the key usage, encrypt, verify, wrap, and derive, and then it's got the CA um, signature right here. So these are all the fields that are present in, um, well, these are some of the fields that are present in uh, SSL certificates. There are many, many, many other fields also. But this is what my browser will display to me in a nice user-friendly way. How many of you go and look at your certificates for fun? All of you, good. So this is not news. Okay, um, so so much for RSA key exchange. Um, I will just briefly go over the Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, for TLS also. So we're all on the same page again. Um, it starts the same way. We have uh, Alice sending a, her client hello and a list of supported cipher suites to Google. Um, then, um, Okay, Google will respond with um, its server random, its certificate, and then um, if it chooses a Diffie-Hellman cipher suite, um, then it will send the value G to the A, um, and it will sign using its key the value G to the A. Um, and this value here, G to the A, this could be either in um, a group um, of integers mod prime, or it could be in, say, an elliptic curve. I'm going to treat them both the same way because they essentially act the same. So um, Alice then responds with her value to the B, um, and everybody max the dialog, and then um, so everything has been sent, sent already, and then um, the website sent, starts sending its encrypted contents. And in this key exchange, we have um, a few more values that should be random. We should have are randomly generated for each session or roughly for each session value G to the A and G to the B. Um, so. Any questions on this? Everybody's good? Everybody's happy with Diffie-Hellman? Yes. 
So um, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, it has slightly better security guarantees. Um, so still the public keys are used to um, bind domain names to certificates and to sign certificates. Um, and a compromised key in this case, you could man in the middle live connection as it was happening. So replace the values g to the a and g to the b with your own favorite values. Um, during the, during the key exchange, and then, and then be able to read the encrypted contents. But um, after the fact, um, this since it has this sort of forward secrecy property, if somebody computes this um, public RSA key, they still don't learn anything about the value of the session key um, because um, the session key is derived from the Diffie Hellman key exchange. Yeah? Yeah, but in some sense, uh, you say someone computes this RSA key, so if someone factors the RSA key, mm -hmm. then we, you had trouble before, you don't now. But, uh, well, it's not, as far as we know, it's not harder to compute logs than to factor, so where, where is the difference? Well, there's one difference, which is that if you, um, say, had a 1024, well, if, if you assume that it takes, I don't know, say, a month for somebody to factor a 1024-bit RSA key, um, and they spend that month and then they get to decrypt several billion communications. Um, that's a, a month well spent. Whereas if they have to spend a month to do, um, say, a 1024 bit discrete log and they get one of these values for one connection, then that's a slightly different trade off. Uh, yeah, I really don't agree because if the group is fixed, then usually oh, okay. we pay the price of a pre computation for one month and then mm -hmm. individual logs should be faster. How much faster? Uh, well, it depends in which range we are, but if we assume that this is a number field sieve, then uh, usually the computing one log is, uh, should be well under an hour. Well under an hour? Yes. For, oh, okay. if, if the computation, of, if the pre-computation is accessible, then computing one log should be cheap. I need to go to the rest of your lectures then, because <laughs> I, I thought that, um, uh, I thought that you, you balanced the, the two steps of the... You, no, you, you know. balance steps in the pre-computation, but you don't okay. balance anything in the individual logarithm, at least for the old algorithm. Um, okay. Good to know. Okay, so we should... We should um, well, I, I should say, um, I'll do this shortly, but uh, using... doing Diffie-Hellman over... Um, uh, modulo primes is not actually that common. So basically everybody's used to doing it for elliptic curve groups. Um, which, I don't know if that changes. Does that change anything? Mm, well, no. it, it changed something if your elliptic curves are, if we have no, no attack on them, which is often the case. Uh, but if, if it's one of the elliptic curves for which there is, there is some index calculus uh, technique, uh, then you have the same kind of issue. So, so the, it's um, really, it's really unclear. But well, but there is another difference. So, uh, with RSA, you can go to the server and steal the factorization. Yeah. With Diffie-Hellman, usually you can't. Yeah. So that's that's a very good point. So um, there are only so with with um, elliptic curves with Diffie-Hellman, there are basically three curves that anybody ever uses, and these are the NIST curves. Um, so I have a list of, of cipher suites that are negotiated for elliptic curves that I'll show you in a second. Um, I sadly don't have the, the cipher suites that are negotiated if you don't support elliptic curves, but um, if you do support elliptic curves, then, then that's what gets, what gets negotiated. So for um, but the, um, your point about people stealing keys, that is probably the much bigger threat model um, rather than <coughs> why, why would you work to factor all these keys when you could just um, either hack into the server and steal them or just send a court order mandating that somebody um, turn over their secret keys? So our, our threat models as cryptographers are having to change a little bit. Um, it's good to know about discrete logs. I will no longer say that... Uh, Diffie Holland has any uh, forward secrecy <coughs> problems. Okay. Any other questions? Corrections? Comments? Everybody's happy? Sort of? <coughs> Not really. Um, okay. 
now I have some data. Um, we like data. Uh, so here's some, um, a collection of scans of HTTPS coming from many different papers and data sets. Um, so the general methodology here is that you can use Nmap or Zmap to find posts with the relevant port open. Once you find, um, so you scan everything, then you find the much smaller list of posts that have that port open. Um, then for all the IP addresses that have that port open, um, you send a client hello. That can be just a fixed string because who cares? Um, and the server will just respond with, hello, here's my certificate. And then you snarf all the certificates, store them, do some analysis. Um, so here's a collection of surveys. You can see that each one gets progressively larger. Um, so the EFF survey in 2010 um, found 16.2 million uh, IP addresses with port 443 open and actually successfully completed a handshake with 7.7 .7 million of them. Um, a year later, um, we found almost 30 million posts with port 443 open and, and actually successfully completed a handshake with 13 million of them. This is the number of unique cert, uh, certificates, by the way. So you can see that the number of unique certificates is much smaller than the number of successful handshakes that we do. So there are a lot of repeated certificates already out there. Um, then later surveys using, um, these were using Nmap, later surveys using Zmap, so they have a less delay in between um, finding posts with the open port and actually collecting the certificates, found um, even larger numbers of successful handshakes and certificates. Um, and this is due both to um, uh, HTTPS becoming more common um, and also probably to better scanning methodology. Um, this last one is a, uh, a, um, a scan that we did um, for a paper studying elliptic curve cryptography. And in this scan, the results are different because we said, hello, we only support elliptic curve cipher suites. Talk to us. And you can see that the number of successful handshakes was much smaller. I couldn't find the numbers for the number of certificates that we have. Yeah? So, for a second, what's, why is the gap between the, the number of open ports and the number of successful handshakes? Where does that gap come from? So, some of it is because things will move around very quickly. Some of it is because things might have port 443 open, but they don't actually speak TLS for whatever reason. They're doing something else on port 443. Um, but I suspect a lot of it is just that um, things move around or they, they shut down um, in between when the scan happened and, and when the actual connection happened. Any other questions? Yeah? So the These are identical certificates. So things that have exactly the same common name, exactly the same public key, exactly the same signature, exactly the same dates of validity, everything. So it's literally the same certificate being served for multiple IP addresses. Um, you said, okay, plus the uh, scan you just announced that you support ETC. Uh, what did you support, uh, what was announced in the, the earlier scan? So did you support all 200, I don't know how many cipher suite combinations, or? Probably not everything, but like the, the most common ones. So that, that might have also missed things. I could be wrong, you might want to check the papers for, for the actual details. Supporting, so supporting things like RSA key exchange with like really common um, ciphers is a good way to be supported. So here's some data from certificates. I apologize, this is a little, a little weird. This is what I could actually find from the data sets that I had on my computer. Um, so um, the, from the scan from 2011, um, this is the number of uh, certificates that had each type of public key. So these are the keys that are used to sign the certificates or to, um, to sign the, the key exchange. Um, well, to encrypt the key exchange. Um, these are the public keys for the signature. So um, almost all of them are RSA. So the amount of support for um, D 
DSA, the digital signature algorithm, the CDSA, um, is very small. GOST is a Russian um, cipher collection. So basically, you can see that for certificates, we don't need to talk about anything but RSA, essentially. Um, here's some numbers. This is just for trusted invalid certificates, which is much smaller than the number of actual certificates. So here um, we have, say, two or three million um, valid certificates. That means, well, so, so trusted means that they are signed by a certificate authority that is trusted by any one of the major browsers. Um, so Valid means signed, trusted means, or um, trusted means signed, valid means currently within the dates that um, are in the certificate. So within RSA, you can see the most of the, oh, this should be 1024, sorry. Um, so most of the, um, basically everybody's, well, most people are using RSA 1024. 2048, um, a shockingly large number of people are using, still using 1024 but in RSA, including certificate authorities, which is a little bit scary. Um, and an awful lot of people are still using 512 bit RSA, which you can factor in a day yourself. Why do you say an awful 16, right? Um, 2,600 certificates were are still being served that were signed. 16, yeah, okay, are still valid. But at this point, we should have nothing valid. Okay. But given, given that 512-bit RSA should have been dead since the 90s, we should see nothing here. <laughs> 1496-bit RSA is less common than you might suspect. Right? People are somehow choosing smaller key sizes rather than being conservative. Could that happen? With either one of the accelerations or whatever. Very, very possibly. I'm sure it also has to do with defaults, like software defaults. People just set, you know, generate me a key and you just press the button and the default is set to 24 you. Any other questions here? Okay, so here's the list of um, cipher suites that get negotiated if you scan saying I only support elliptic curves. Um, so the most common one is people negotiating the null cipher suite because they don't speak elliptic curves, um, which is the correct um, action, I guess. Um, so uh, the next most common is, seems like a, a perfectly good cipher suite, EC, DHE, RSA with, uh, so ephemeral, diffi uh, ephemeral elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman um, with uh, RSA signatures with um, AES-128 and CBC and SHA-1. That's, that's good. Um, <coughs> you see some things that are not um, elliptic curves, which means these servers are not doing what they should. Um, I guess they got confused if you say we only support elliptic curves. This, this goes on and on and on for a very long time, down into single digits. There's a lot of weird behavior out there. Any questions? Okay. Um, I will finish up, I think, relatively briefly just by talking about a few other um, sources of data. So SSH, we haven't seen SSH yet, so maybe this will be slightly new. Um, so the SSH handshake is, it's a, it's a handshake. Um, you negotiate keys. Um, it always uses Diffie-Hellman. So the question is just which, which Diffie-Hellman group do you use? Um, actually, it occurs to me, Antoine, that I don't know how you negotiate the group in TLS. Maybe that was covered yesterday, but um, for Diffie-Hellman. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it's fixed or, or whether there's some way to... I think yesterday uh, um, it was said, okay, for the elliptic curves they are fixed. Standardized yeah, they're fixed ones. Number, but for prime, for uh, prime fields 
that the server just send his own choice. Okay. So the server could regenerate its own, um, yeah, its own different one every time. I mean, it doesn't to. seem likely that the yeah. server is going to generate a new group every time. Well, you know, developers are probably lazy. So we have some of that data. I should just go look at it. <laughs> uh, I don't think we actually asked that question before. So I'm, I'm learning things. Okay. So um, at least so so with SSH, it is possible to like um, to choose different groups every time if you want to. And again, I don't know if I have good answers here. So the um, so the client and the server just say hello to each other. Then they send a list of ciphers that each of them respectively supports. And now that they both have their list of ciphers, they go through a deterministic process to find a cipher that they both actually support, that they then agree on. Um, the client sends her preferred group size, and the server responds with a set of group parameters um, explicitly. Um, then the client sends over her part of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange to the A, um, and the server responds with its host public key, g to the b, and then it signs the hash of everything that's been transmitted so far. Um, once uh, Alice gets uh, the host public key, she computes a hash of that and checks um, whether that matches her stored fingerprint um, if she has seen this key before um, that is associated with this server. And if it doesn't match, then it displays a really alarming error message to her. And then once, uh, uh, once Alice has verified the fingerprint, then she logs into the server. And, and if she's using password-based uh, authentication, she just sends the encryption of her password uh, over the encrypted channel. So I have put in red all of the things here that should be randomized. Um, and I've put the signature here in red because um, Unlike the case of um, TLS, we have um, the possibility of using, say, DSA signatures, and DSA signatures are randomized. So that's why I put the, uh, the signature here in red. So here's a little picture uh, of me having to verify the um, fingerprint of, the, the host key fingerprint of um, a server that I'm connecting to. So um, the SSH host keys are used to authenticate the host to the client. So uh, this is a trust on first use model, or um, if I'm really paranoid, I can go into the, my own server and check whether the fingerprint is verified. And if, as long as the fingerprints match, I assume I'm not being man in the middle um, during my connection. So if you compromise the SSH host keys, this can be used to, to man in the middle of the connections. Otherwise, since you're using Diffie-Hellman, um, in order to break this encryption, you would have to either, um, you would have to break this somehow, compute dispute logs, do something more efficient. Um, so here's some numbers of scans of SSH. Um, so the two scan data sets that I have access to are from the mining of PCP paper from 2012 and um, an elliptic curve based uh, data set from 2013. Um, so in both cases, we had about the same number of successful handshakes. Um, again, the number of successful handshakes is much smaller than the number of things that respond on a port. Actually, it occurs to me now that it might just be that some things will respond to everything on a port so that um, port scanning doesn't work, for example. That might be also a problem. Um, so a list of public key types. Um, since there are multiple um, uh, public key, uh, multiple host keys that, um, so SSH servers can have multiple types of SSH host keys. So these are, these are um, key types with multiplicity. So the, the most servers support both RSA and DSA um, public keys, for example. So I've counted these. Um, so you can see that almost everybody supports RSA, an almost equal number of, of hosts support DSA, and a growing number support elliptic curve DSA. And a very small number support cost. And I 
don't have numbers on the key exchange algorithms from the first scan, but from the signal of the curve-based scan, um, key exchange, so Diffie-Hellman mod primes, um, everybody supports um, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, you get, I don't know, about 10%, um, and um, a tiny number supports some um, RSA 1024 key exchange. Much tinier number of support elliptic curve to feed Hellman over a Gauss curve. Um, so, PGP um, is another large um, public key infrastructure. Um, so, PGP keys, um, I'm not going to go a lot into the details of PGP, but the big picture that you have in your head is that you can use PGP keys to sign and encrypt email messages. And if you compromise somebody's PGP key, you can decrypt messages that are intended for that person or sign messages or, or other keys as that person. The reason PGP is interesting from this perspective is that you can download repositories um, that are on the internet of PGP keys in public. So you get um, a large number of keys and signatures. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is, I mean, these are these are designed for people who want to start their own PGP key servers and join the web of trust. Um, and in order to bootstrap that process, you can just download millions of uh, people's public key PGP keys and um, start serving them on your own server. So, um, for PGP, Algamal and DSA are much more common than RSA. This is a sort of historical artifact. Um, another source of public keys is the Bitcoin <coughs> blockchain. Um, I'll also not talk a huge amount of Bitcoin, but the picture that you should have in your head is that a Bitcoin is actually a series of transactions sending um, a Bitcoin from one public key to another public key. And each transaction consists of the previous owner signing a transaction that says, I am sending this Bitcoin to this other public key, and I sign that with my address. So a transaction is a public key and a signature. And these are publicly reported, uh, recorded in the Bitcoin blockchain, um, which now has millions and millions of entries. Um, and that means that if you want to, okay. Um, so I'm waving my hands massively and lying to you, but um, essentially, um, that means that the security of a Bitcoin relies entirely on the security of the public key of the um, current owner. Um, so a compromised Bitcoin key can be used to transfer any Bitcoins out of that key's account. So you just sign a message that says, I am transferring this coin to my own address. And that will appear publicly in the blockchain, so they'll, they'll know who stole, or at least which address stole their, their Bitcoin. They, might not be able to, they won't be able to do anything. So the reason this is relevant to um, the kinds of studies that we're going to do is that um, because the blockchain is public, um, that's part of the Bitcoin protocol, um, you can just download the entire blockchain and then you have a collection of millions of public keys and millions of signatures. And Bitcoin uses um, elliptic curve DSA um, for its signatures and they use a somewhat un unusual curve choice. Um, this is from a year ago, so it's surely grown much larger since then, but the number of transactions in the blockchain was 22 million, and there were 46 million <coughs> keys and signatures in the blockchain. Okay, so that's actually all I have for this first part, so we can go have our coffee break, um, and then return for another hour and a half of actually breaking all these public keys that we've just found.